Welcome to The Sins of Scientology, where we peel back the layers of secrecy surrounding one of the world's most enigmatic organizations. I'm Sandy McKenna, your guide through the shadowy corridors of Scientology's past, joined by my co-host, Abraham Ulrich. Together we uncover the hidden truths and dark tales that have remained shrouded in mystery. In this episode, we delve into the life of Heber Gentsch, a figure whose journey from the heart of Mormon Utah to the upper echelons of Scientology is as intriguing as it is unsettling. Born into a world of faith and strict moral codes, Heber's early years seemed destined for a path of righteousness, but fate had other plans. Segment by segment, we unravel Heber's transformation from his beginnings as a devout Mormon, influenced by his father's academic stature at Brigham Young University, to his rise in the world of journalism and arts, Heber's story is a mosaic of ambition and adaptation. Yet, it is his deep plunge into Scientology that casts the longest shadow. As president of the Church of Scientology International, Heber Gentsch became a master of media manipulation and public relations, defending the church through countless controversies. But behind the scenes, his life was fraught with tension, secrecy, and power struggles that would eventually lead to his dramatic fall from grace. Heber's personal life marked with marriages to influential Scientologists and the tragic tale of his son Alexander add layers of complexity and sorrow to his story. And then there was the whole, the infamous prison where Heber was reportedly confined a place shrouded in allegations of abuse and coercion, a place that serves as a stark symbol of Scientology's darker side. Join us as we navigate through Heber Gentsch's serpentine journey, a tale of faith, power, and betrayal. This is not just the story about a man. It is a story about the lengths to which an organization will go to protect its secrets and the human cost of those secrets. Stay with us as we lift the veil on the story of Heber Gentsch, right here on The Sins of Scientology. Heber Carl Gentsch was born on November 30, 1935, in Salt Lake City, Utah. His upbringing was significantly shaped by the religious and culture environment of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the LDS Church, commonly known as the Mormon Church. Heber was never baptized into the LDS Church, but he still identified as a believing Mormon. Heber's father, Carl F. Chench, was an esteemed professor of arts and aesthetics at Brigham Young University, BYU, a major institution affiliated with the LDS Church in Provo, Utah. His connection to BYU and the LDS Church profoundly influenced Heber's early years, immersing him in a community deeply rooted in Mormon values and teachings. Growing up in a devoted Mormon family, Heber was instilled with the principles and doctrines of the LDS Church from a young age. The Mormon Church emphasizes family, community service, and adherence to strict moral code which would have been integral to Heber's childhood. Regular attendance at church services, participation in church-related activities, and the influence of Mormon teachings on a daily life were likely constant during his formative years. Heber's educational journey began in this religiously enriched environment. He attended local school in Salt Lake City, where his upbringing in a Mormon family would have been both a commonality and a cornerstone of his social and educational experiences. Heber attended Weber College in Ogden, Utah and the University of Utah. In 1959, he earned a degree in communications and Eastern religion. His father's academic position may have also provided Heber with early exposure to the arts, aesthetics, and the value of higher education. Given his father's role at BYU, Heber may have had access to a wealth of cultural and intellectual resources. This exposure could have sparked an early interest in communication, arts, and public speaking, skills he later utilized extensively in his career with Scientology. Salt Lake City, as the headquarter of the LDS Church, offered a unique cultural landscape. Heber's upbringing in this city would have included participation in traditional Mormon practices, such as attending the semi-annual General Conference, engaging in community service projects, and possibly preparing for a mission, a common rite of passage for young Mormon men. 
the solid religious and moral framework provided by his Mormon upbringing likely influenced Heber's later decision and career path. While he eventually diverged significantly from the LDS Church by joining Scientology, the communication skills, discipline, and the values instilled in him during his early years remained evident throughout his life. Heber's transition from a traditional Mormon upbringing to a prominent figure in Scientology is a testament to the complex interplay of his early experiences in the diverse path his life would take. The foundations laid during his formative years in Salt Lake City undoubtedly shaped his worldview, approach to leadership in the challenging and often controversial landscape of his later career. Before becoming involved in Scientology, Hubert Gensch worked in the arts and media, where he developed skills that would prove to be invaluable in his role within the Church of Scientology. Heber pursued higher education at the University of Utah, majoring in communications. This academic background gave him a solid foundation in various aspects of media, including journalism, public relations, and broadcasting. The University of Utah's communications program is known for offering a comprehensive curriculum covering theatrical and practical elements of media and communication, equipping students with the skills necessary for a variety of careers. After completing his studies, Gentsch put his education to the test, honing his writing, reporting, and investigative skills. Heber had a keen eye for detail, an ability to communicate effectively, and a dedication to uncovering what he saw as the truth, attributes that Gentsch would later carry into his role as spokesperson for Scientology. Heber dipped his toe into the entertainment industry, perhaps with aspirations of becoming an actor. During the 1960s, Heber had bit acting parts in a few notable television shows. He had a fleeting appearance as a German lieutenant back in 1965 in episode one of the TV series Combat, a war drama set during World War II. He must have been convincing because two years later in 1967, he was once again cast as a German SS lieutenant in episode one of the series Garrison's Guerrillas, a group of convicts turned commandos during World War II. Additionally, he played Chet Nichols in the King of Empty Cups episode of The Mod Squad, which aired on January 20, 1970. The Mod Squad was a counterculture police drama about three young undercover cops. His studies at the University of Utah and his bit acting roles in notable TV shows laid the foundation for his later involvement in Scientology, where he would become a prominent figure. Combining his education and experience in journalism, public relations, and the arts gave Heber a unique skill set. He developed strong communication skills, deep understanding of media dynamics, and the ability to manage public perception, all of which were crucial in his later work in Scientology. His background in media and communications allowed him to adeptly handle the church's public relations, manage its interactions with the press, and effectively communicate Scientology's messages to the public. This expertise was significant as Scientology often appeared in the public eye facing scrutiny and controversy. Heber Jenge joined the Church of Scientology in the late 1960s. This period was a time of significant expansion for Scientology as it was establishing itself more firmly in the United States and internationally. Jenge's entry into the church began a long and influential career within the organization. In his own words, Heber shares why he joined and believes in Scientology during this 1985 60 Minutes interview. Now, the thing is that there are millions of Scientologists who are very happy with Scientology. Millions. Millions why? and millions. Why? Why? Because it works. Because it's not something that is done to you, which is what psychiatry basically operates on. It is something you do something with. For me personally, I grew up in Utah. I was one of the people who was the recipients of fallout from Yucca Flats. And the wonderfulness of this government chose not to tell the doctors in the area what it was like to get radiation burns over your body from fallout, which I got and I almost died from. Doctor didn't even know what it was. Had cortisone not been a brand new drug at the time, I would have died 24 hours later. And for years and years, I carried within me the aching bones and the sensation of enormous fatigue from that particular experience. It was Hubbard's technology, which alleviated that for the first time in my life. 
So I'm not a person who's going to be attacking L. Ron Hubbard. And you will find there are others like me for different reasons. Million? I would say millions, yeah. How many million? Upon joining Scientology, Jensch quickly rose through the ranks. His journalism and public relations background made him a valuable asset to the church, often embroiled in public controversies and legal battles. He started taking on roles that involved managing the church's image and communicating its message to the public. One of Gentius' early roles was within the Guardian's office, the church's intelligence and public relations arm. The Guardian's office handled legal affairs, public relations, and other external activities to protect and promote Scientology. This experience allowed Gentch to deeply understand the church's strategy for dealing with external scrutiny and criticism. In 1983, Hebert Gentsch was appointed president of the Church of Scientology International, CSI. CSI serves as the central organization that oversees the activities of Scientology churches around the world. As president, Gentsch became the official spokesperson for the church, a role that required him to represent Scientology in various public and legal forums. Here is another clip from the 1985 60 Minutes interview where we hear Gentsch in his role as a spokesperson for the church. Adverse to his existence and what he's doing. But Mr. Hubbard, unequivocally, has impacted this civilization, in my estimation, more greatly than anyone I've ever met. Why has he not met you, you, him? Why has he become, why is he a recluse? A recluse? No, I think he's a man as they decided in the Riverside court that he has a right to privacy. It's America. This is not Russia. And he has a right to privacy. This man is concerned with research on the areas of the human spirit. He's done it his whole life. It's been his life's work to assist people. And he's chosen to take a little sabbatical and do that and to continue writing. You know that he has bestsellers on the bestseller lists last year all over the country, all over the world. When is it very well public? When did he last appear in public? Oh, I would say it was probably four or five years ago. Where? California. He was doing films in California, shooting films for the Church of Scientology, a number of people working with him. Is it conceivable that you would make him available or he might become available for this broadcast? I wouldn't want uh, Mr. Hubbard. I can't speak for him, first of all. I don't think he'd be interested. I don't think this is a show that's, um, a show that's concerned with religion that much. And I don't think it's a show in which... I think when Mr. Hubbard decides, Mr. Wallace, to make an appearance, it's going to be a much larger appearance than something like 60 Any. As the president of CSI, Gensch was heavily involved in the church's public relation efforts. He frequently appeared in the media to defend Scientology against allegations of abuse, fraud, and other misconduct. His ability to articulate the church's position and counteract negative publicity was key to Scientology's strategy to maintain its public image. Gentsch's role also involved intense travel to represent the church at international events, conferences, and legal proceedings. He played a significant part in Scientology's efforts to gain recognition as a religion in various countries, which often involve complex legal and political negotiations. Gentsch was at the forefront of many of Scientology's legal battles throughout his tenure. The church faced numerous lawsuits and investigations during this period, particularly in the United States and Europe. Gentsch's responsibilities including managing these legal challenges and working to mitigate their impact on the church's operation and reputation. One of the most notable legal cases during his tenure was the Operation Snow White scandal, in which the church was found to have infiltrated various government agencies to purge unfavorable records, Although this scandal primarily involved the Guardian's office, it had widespread implication for the church and required significant PR efforts to address the fallout. As the president of the Church of Scientology International, or CSI, Heber was the church's primary representative on the global stage. His role required extensive travel to various countries to attend international events, conferences, and legal proceedings. Through his efforts, Heber worked to promote Scientology, defend against criticism, and seek official recognition as a legitimate religion. Heber attended numerous international events and conferences where he spoke about Scientology's beliefs, practices, and societal contributions. These appearances were designed to present a positive image of Scientology and to counteract negative perceptions. For example, 
Heber participated in a conference on religious freedom and human rights, arguing that Scientology should be afforded the same legal protections and recognition as the other religious groups. One notable example was his participation in the International Association of Scientologists, IAS annual events. At these gatherings, held in various locations worldwide, Heber delivered speeches highlighting Scientology's growth, achievements, and efforts to combat human rights abuses. These events were attended by Scientologists from numerous countries and were a platform for reinforcing the Church's global unity and mission. Heber played a pivotal role in Scientology's legal battles in multiple countries. These efforts often involved complex legal and political negotiations aimed at securing recognition for Scientology as a bona fide religion. Here are some detailed examples of his involvement. In Germany, Scientology faced significant opposition, with authorities viewing it as a commercial enterprise rather than a religion. Heber actively advocated for the Church's recognition and countering claims of its anti-democratic activities. He engaged with German officials, participated in public debates, and provided testimony in legal proceedings. Despite these efforts, Germany continues to scrutinize Scientology, reflecting the challenges Heber faced in altering entrenched perceptions. France was another battleground where Scientology sought recognition as a religion. The French government classified Scientology as a sect, subjecting it to financial and legal scrutiny. Heber worked to challenge this classification, representing Scientology in court cases and engaging in public relations campaigns to shift public opinion. His advocacy included highlighting Scientology's charitable activities and contributions to social causes. Heber's efforts were more successful in Spain. After a prolonged legal battle, the National Court of Spain recognized Scientology as a religion in 2007. Heber's role included overseeing the legal strategy, engaging with Spanish legal experts, and presenting arguments emphasizing Scientology's religious nature and alignment with the principles of religious freedom enshrined in Spanish law. The UK also posed challenges with Scientology initially being denied recognition as a religion. Heber's involvement included lobbying efforts, legal challenges, and public relations campaigns, his work contributed to the landmark decision in 2013 when the UK Supreme Court ruled that Scientology's chapel in London could be registered as a place of worship, thus granting the Church the recognition it had long sought. In addition to legal battles, Heber was involved in political negotiations with government officials and policymakers. His approach often involved framing Scientology within the broader context of religious freedom and human rights. By aligning Scientology's cause with these universally accepted principles, he were aimed to garner support from international organizations and human rights advocates. For instance, he engaged with the United Nations Human Rights Council and other international bodies to present Scientology's case as one of religious persecution. The strategy was intended to apply pressure on governments that were hostile to Scientology and build alliances with other religious and human rights groups. Heber Gentsch's extensive travel and representation efforts significantly impacted Scientology's global standing. While he faced substantial opposition and numerous legal setbacks, his work also led to important victories that advanced Scientology's recognition and legitimacy in several countries. His legacy in that area is marked by the challenges he encountered and his progress in advocating for Scientology on the world stage. These efforts were far from smooth sailing, though. Heber Jones was arrested in Spain in 1988, along with 69 other Scientologists, and it became an international incident. Protested by the Church of Scientology through any means they could think of, to try to get Heber out of jail. 23 leaders of the L.A.-based Church of Scientology are still in custody in Spain tonight. Nine of them ordered to jail on charges of swindling Spaniards out of money they paid for drug rehabilitation. Jane Wells talked to Scientologists in Hollywood tonight as they try to get information about their jailed leader. This is Alexander Jentz, and he is here with me tonight because his father is not here. His father is in a jail in Madrid, Spain. 
Scientologists believe church president Jens and other members have been arrested in Spain because their drug rehabilitation efforts there have worked too well. Obviously, we have cut across with a drug rehabilitation program that is working and is expanding in Spain, some vested interest that is interested in drug proliferation and drug addiction. 71 church members were arrested Saturday at a meeting as police investigate them for fraud, extortion, and tax evasion. Most have been released, but not Jens, a former actor who's been with the church 25 years. We stand for religious liberty. We stand for those freedoms. Scientologists charge that their people are being mistreated in Spanish jails. They say they're being denied blankets and mattresses and forced to drink dirty water and eat only cookies for meals. The church was founded in the 50s by author L. Ron Hubbard. Its purpose, to free the soul through knowledge. But some former members say the reality is much more sinister. Hannah Eltringham says she was put in a virtual prison camp for a year when the church perceived she had evil intentions. Um, we had to run everywhere we went. We had to run, whether it was carrying pails of sand or concrete up ten flights of steps for building purposes, we had to run. The church continues to deny such charges, saying it is being harassed by governments around the world. Meanwhile, the Spanish judge will determine within 24 hours what charges, if any, will be made against Jens and those remaining in jail with him. Jane Wells, Fox News. After three weeks of incarceration, Heber was granted bail of a million dollars and fled the country immediately, never to return. It wasn't until 2002 that the charges were dropped and the bond money returned. Heber Jensch married Australian Scientologist Yvonne Gillum after her divorce from Peter Gillum, one of the top lecturers on the subject of Scientology. Yvonne Gillum Jensch was the founder of the Celebrity Center for the Church of Scientology and grew it to more than 200 staff. They married from 1972 until her death from cancer in 1978. In her book, Commodore's Messenger, A Child Adrift in the Sea Organization, her daughter, Janice Gillum Grady, recalls, Tragically, upon Mom's arrival in Clearwater, she was sequestered to a room with a few to no visitors. She could no longer work, so she was considered a malingerer and someone not pulling their weight. Only my stepfather Heber Jench, my father Peter Gillum, and my sister Terry Gamboa, who had to sneak away to Florida from California, had a chance to say goodbye. Her illness as well as her ultimate death, was considered bad PR for Scientology. I could not shake the feeling of betrayal, the lies about her condition, the cover-ups, and how others prevented me from knowing what really happened just held my grief in place. This marriage preceded his more publicly known relationship with Karen de la Carrière. Karen was a prominent figure within the Church of Scientology and one of its highly trained auditors. The couple's relationship united two influential Scientologists, further solidifying their roles within the organization. Their marriage was a notable union within the church. Given Karen's significant contributions and standings within Scientology's hierarchy, born in England, she became involved with Scientology in the 1960s and quickly rose through the ranks due to her dedication and skills. Karen was trained directly by Scientology's founder, L. Ron Hubbard, and became one of the few individuals to attain the highest level of auditing and training within the church. Known as a Class 7 auditor, this elite status made her a highly influential figure within Scientology's internal structure. Karen de la Carrière and Heber Gentch's marriage was a significant union within Scientology. Both were influential in their own rights. Heber as the president of the Church of Scientology International and Karen as the top auditor and trainer. Their marriage symbolized a powerful alliance within the church, merging their respective spheres of influence. Karen's contributions were primarily within Scientology's internal operations. She served aboard the flagship Apollo and was trained by LRH to the level of Class 7 Auditor, CS, one of the only seven LRH ever made. As a Class 7 auditor, she delivered advanced auditing sessions and trained other auditors. Her work involved helping members reach higher levels of spiritual awareness and clearing the psychological barriers believed to impede their progress. Karen's expertise and dedication earned her a respected place in the church's hierarchy. The marriage between Heber and Karen was notable for several reasons. 
both were highly visible and respected within Scientology, with intensive contributions to the church's growth and operations, their marriage represented the coming together of two powerful entities within the organization. Together, they yielded significant influence over both the public perception and internal workings of Scientology. Heber's public relations skills and Karen's auditing expertise made them a formidable team. Their relationship provided mutual support in their demanding role. Karen's work as an auditor was complemented by Heber's efforts to defend and promote Scientology publicly, creating a strong partnership within the church. The couple eventually separated and Karen de la Carrier left the Church of Scientology. Her departure was met with severe repercussion due to the church's policy of disconnection, which mandates cutting off all ties with those deemed suppressive persons or SPs. This policy led her to estrangement from Heber and other church members, including her son, Alexander. After leaving Scientology, Karen became one of its most vocal critics. She has shared her experiences and exposed various practices within the church mainly focusing on its policies regarding disconnection and treatment of members. Her outspoken stance has brought significant attention to the challenges and controversies surrounding Scientology. Karen de la Carrier continues to be an active critic of Scientology, using her platform to advocate for those affected by the church's practices. She has provided insight into the inner workings of Scientology and highlighted the personal costs of his policies on family relationships. In 2004, Heber Gensch fell out of favor with David Miscavige, the church's leader. As a result, he was sent to the hole, an office prison at Scientology's international base in Los Angeles. The hole was notorious for its harsh conditions and was initially called the A2E room before being renamed. The hole is described as a facility with barred windows and doors, where around 60 to 100 high-ranking Scientology executives, including both men and women, were confined. They could leave only to shower, and their time was otherwise spent in intense training and confessions. The conditions were squalid, and the detainees, sleeping on cots, floors, and desktops, in extremely crowded rooms. Meals consisted of substandard food referred to as slop. Punishments in the hole included humiliation and physical abuse. Executives were sometimes forced to play games like musical chairs. Where the stakes were high, losers were threatened with expulsion from the church and separation from their families. Reports from former members, such as Mike Rinder, indicate that violence and coercion were common with detainees subjected to beatings and other forms of abuse to extract confessions and demonstrate loyalty. The harsh treatment was part of a broader pattern of discipline with Scientology, where perceived disobedience or incompetence could result in confinement in the whole. Miscavige's leadership style was marked by such extreme measures, which he justified as necessary for maintaining control and enforcing discipline within the organization. Despite the Church's denials of the whole's existence, numerous accounts from former Scientologists and investigative reports have detailed its reality and severe conditions endured by those confined. David Gensch told Tony Ortega of The Village Voice on July 20th in 2012 that the last time he spoke to his brother Heber was around 2009. At that time, he urged his brother to break out of Scientology's international base near Hemet, California. Heber said, I don't think I can ever get out of here. His brother told him, you have to try. And the last thing he said to him was, I'll never get out of here alive. Since that time, workers at the base have refused his calls. David Gent said, they won't let me talk to him. Heber just lost his son, Alexander. I called and told them, I'd like to talk to my brother about this. They told me, you can't come. We don't want you here. David Gent told them he'd go down there and they'd have to let him see Heber. But they said, Heber is not going to be able to talk to you, so it's best you just don't come. David didn't know that his brother had been let out of the base for a rare trip to Los Angeles to attend his son's memorial. Heber has rarely been sighted in public since 2004. In 2006, Miscavige did let Heber out of the hole for one final stage appearance at the Maiden Voyage event. According to Tizanio Lugli, an Italian musician and former Scientologist, 
He saw Heber Gentsch at Isaac Hayes' funeral in 2008. Heber hasn't attended any Scientology events, he hasn't answered any communication, and he is unavailable to the media. Karen and Heber Gentsch had one son, Alexander Gentsch, born on November 26, 1984. Alexander was deeply involved in Scientology from a young age, reflecting his parents' high-level involvement. He participated in various Scientology programs and was raised within the church's doctrines and practices. Alexander's upbringing was heavily influenced by Scientology, and he spent most of his early life in Scientology environment, including the Sea Organization, a dedicated group of the church's most committed members. As a child, Alexander Gentsch was raised as Scientology royalty. When Alex was around 11 or 12 years old, he was recruited to join the Sea Organization. Sea Org members live and work communally, often under strict conditions and with significant demands of their time and loyalty to the church. With his father still part of the Sea Org, Alexander joined them, hoping he could see his father more often. Instead, Alexander was shipped to Scientology's largest church facility in Clearwater, Florida, called the Flag Services Organization, where he did estates work, mainly cleaning. His parents remained in California. Alexander Gensch only saw his father 11 times in 15 years, a fact repeated countless times by children of Sea Org parents. He used to call himself the boy without a dad. Let's examine this clip from a news reporter talking to Karen De La Carriere about Alexander. I only saw Heber 11 times in the last 15 years of his life. He We're were... talking about your husband at the time? Yes. Okay. And he wanted to join the Sea Org so that They he promised would... him. The recruiter said, don't you want to see your father? You, he's Sea Org, you'll be Sea Org. It was all a scam. So Alexander joined at eight years old. And I have only myself to blame. I went through horror and torture in the Sea Org. I should have known better, but... I was messed up, Alec. I really was, Allison. I, I, I'm much more savvy now. As a 12-year-old boy with little formal education and under the care of random adults at Flag, Alex had no real exposure to the outside world or the dangers of sexual predation. Alexander was found to be having sexual intercourses at the age of 12 at the Flag land base with a 40-year-old woman in the Office of Special Affairs. Once this became well known within the organization, and to avoid a potential PR nightmare, Alexander was sent to the Continental Liaison Office, or CLO, West US. This was the management body for Scientology in the Western United States and had many other functions, including a state's work for the entire Big Blue facility, running the numerous Scientology events, which occur several times a year. By the 1990s, Alexander was running the Boiler Room, a.k.a. Phone Bank, which contacted local Scientologists by phone and email to get them confirmed to come to these events. And he did this for years. Alexander married Andrea Cavon. Both Alexander and Andrea were members of the Sea Organization, Scientology's clergy. But they left in 2010 when Andrea became pregnant, though she later miscarried. They lived for a while in Glendale, California, but eventually moved to Dallas, where Alexander took a job in sales at a Scientology-owned company. Soon it became clear that Alex's sheltered and cloistered life had ill-prepared him and Andrea for living in the real world. His relationship with Andrea reportedly became a strain during this time. In the early 2000s, Alexander's mother Karen was disillusioned with Scientology. She began posting anonymously online about Scientology the Sea Org, and her own experiences under the anonymous name War and Peace. In 2010, she was declared a suppressive person. Alexander was forced to disconnect with his mother when she left Scientology. In the last two years of his life, Alexander was cut off from both his parents. At some point during this time, Alex got into a car accident in Dallas and was put on Oxycontin, a heavy-duty painkiller for back pain. From the limited information we found, it appears that Alex has substance abuse issues as a result of this prescribed medication. He received the methadone prescription. While the drug is prescribed to help heroin addicts with withdrawals, it's also prescribed for acute pain. After losing his job in Dallas, Alexander returned to Los Angeles the last week of June to live with his in-laws. 
he developed a head cold on the trip back and began to take over the counter medications. Unfortunately, this developed into pneumonia, something neither Alex nor his in laws recognized as serious. At this point, Alex was still having trouble breathing and was running a fever. Rather than taking Alex to a hospital or calling a doctor, Scientology decides to deal with this by calling none other than Stan Gershon, an OT8, to give him a touch assist for his inability to breathe. That's right. No hospital. No doctor. They called an OT8 to give him a touch assist for pneumonia. On July 2nd at 9 a.m., Alex's in-laws saw him asleep. 12 hours later, around 9 p.m., Alex still hadn't moved, but no one bothered to check in on him. Tragically, on the morning of July 3rd, Alexander's father-in-law checked in on him and found him unresponsive. He then took his child to school, returned home, and only then called 911. Let's examine this clip from ABC7 News report of the incident. Questions being raised now about the mysterious death of a 27-year-old Southern California man. New at 11, Eyewitness News reporter Leanne Souter joins us with more details about the unusual twists in this case. Leanne. Mark, the L.A. County Coroner's Office is investigating the mysterious death of 27-year-old Andrew Alexander Gench. He was found dead inside a Silmar home July 3rd, but why still remains a mystery. Oh! A moving tribute at sea from mother to son for Alexander Gench, posted on YouTube by family and friends. The 27-year-old's mysterious death now being investigated after he was found dead at his in-law's Silmar home, but it was hours before anyone called 911. The L.A. County Coroner's Office says Alexander's in-laws saw the 27-year-old asleep in his bed on Monday, July 2nd, around 9 a.m. Twelve hours later, around 9 p.m., he hadn't moved, but no one checked on him. The next morning, his father-in-law did check and found Alexander unresponsive. The father-in-law took a child to school. When he returned home, he finally called 911. In this particular case, there was uh, some uh, information that we received that uh, we are looking into along with the fact that we've had uh, other family members uh, provide information or uh, question his death. Can we speak to you guys about Alexander? No one at the in-law's home would talk to us about Alexander's death. The 27-year-old's father is Heber Gench, the president of the Church of Scientology International. Heber Gench hasn't been seen in public for years, but at the height of his influence in the church, he was often seen in the company of high-profile members like John Travolta. Alexander's mother, Karen de la Carriere, left the church and says her son then disconnected from her. Disconnected is a term Scientologists use to describe the decision to cut themselves off from loved ones who leave the church. She says when her son died, she wasn't allowed to see his body and has many questions about his death. Why give the coroner smoke and mirrors and blame it all on Alexander? He was drinking. He was history of over self-medicating. He did this. He did that. Oh, come on. It smells to high heaven. Now, the coroner's office says an autopsy has been completed, but investigators are awaiting toxicology results before determining an exact cause of death. Lee Hyun Suter, ABC7 Eyewitness News. It's been reported that his in-laws made calls to OSA, the Office of Special Affairs, after they found him unresponsive, but before they called 911. His mother was shocked when she received a call from a stranger to let her know that Alexander had been found dead in his bed in the morning of July 3, 2012. She would later learn the name of this stranger, Aaron Smith Levin. In Chris Shelton's video, Alexander Jensch, a Scientology tragedy in three acts, he presented the following audio from Ed Winter, Assistant Chief of Investigations from the Los Angeles Coroner's Office. I was the Assistant Chief. I still am Assistant Chief of Investigations. I oversee all the death investigations in L.A. County uh, and uh, especially the high-profile celebrities uh, uh, and politicians or whatever. On July 3rd, uh, we were advised uh, a, of a death at a private residence in Selmar in the 13,700 block of Oro Grande Street, uh, a 
according to the law enforcement who reported it, is that uh, the decedent was last known to be alive by his in-laws when they left the residence for the day. When they returned later, they uh, he appeared to be in bed sleeping. Uh, that was on the 2nd, and on July 3rd, about 7.30, the decedent was found unresponsive in his bed by his father-in-law uh, during a welfare check. Uh, the decedent, or the father-in-law, did not call for paramedics, however, took his uh, son to school and then returned home uh, and called paramedics. They responded and pronounced him deceased. The decedent was uh, Alexander uh, Jens. We sent an investigator, responded, and he was uh, transported back to our office. Uh, there was an at-scene investigation and an autopsy performed. And that's what uh, our initial uh, investigation was about. Well, number one, uh, when you have a 27-year-old male that uh, passes away and uh, it's reported that uh, he had some sort of a accident and was over-medicating due to a traffic accident, uh, we wanted to find out uh, some additional information and possibly medical history. And uh, he was driven out from Texas to California. And according to the father-in-law, he complained of a, having a head cold, which he took over-the-counter medication. So if you're taking over-the-counter uh, over medication, along with back pain medication, uh, there can be a reaction. However, we weren't able to, uh, you know, connect the dots, so to speak. And... Uh, Supposedly, when the paramedics were there, medication was uncounted for, unaccounted for. So we did have questions. It also was strange that uh, his father-in-law would drive with, instead of calling paramedics when somebody's in distress or unresponsive, why they'd leave, drive, a, drive the kid to school, a child to school, and then return, you know, sometime later. Uh, le you know, found him at 7.30 and came back at 8.23, uh, that's a long time. So there, there, was a, there was some questions, and then his mother contacted us, contacted me, and was providing information, additional information, on his, uh, his personal... Uh, medical issues and other issues. We're able to uh, do an investigation. Uh, we found that after the autopsy, uh, he had acquired pneumonia and was using methadone and took some additional uh, drugs. A couple of things. His, his wife and him are separated. His wife... Uh, is not there at the house and he's staying with his father-in-law then as this investigation proceeded uh, we reached out to the church of scientology and got no response um, tried to talk to the wife and when we'd call the house the father-in-law would say she's not there she's unavailable and she wouldn't talk to us mm. uh, and then uh, we were con I was contacted by an attorney for the church that uh, wanted uh, wanted to have uh, information removed uh, from the report. You know, sometimes we get that, but we had this attorney that called, complained that the mother is making allegations and posting on the internet that Jeff did not call paramedics right away, and she requested a sentence be changed in the report as it is not accurate. Uh, and uh, we told her, hey, the report stands as is. I know that during the initial part of the investigation, we attempted to have 
uh, Riverside County Sheriff's make contact with his father uh, to see you know, to notify him. And the sheriffs called us. They went out to Gold Base and uh, were not granted entry and were told that they would notify uh, Mr. Gents about his son's death. The toxicology report states that Alex had a mixture of medications in his system at the time of his death. At the scene as well, officers recovered an assortment of medication, including meloxicam and gabapentin, hydrocodone, acetaminophen, methadone, prilosec, Sudafed, and Vicks-Nyquil. Had Alex gone to an emergency room or taken to a doctor for his fever and other symptoms and diagnosed correctly, it could have saved his life. You know, I might be one of the few people in the world that found out that my son was dead by a Facebook message from a stranger. My 27-year-old son was lying in the Los Angeles morgue, a dead body with a toe tag, and the Church of Scientology that I slaved for and contributed to for 35 years did not pick up the phone and tell me that my son was dead. His mother was not allowed to see her son one last time, nor did she receive any of his ashes. She held a memorial for Alexander aboard a yacht off the coast of California. Let's examine this clip from Karen De La Carrier speaking about her son at his memorial service. Alexander, uh, many people have said, what, what was Alexander like? And I think this story will We'll tell you what Alexander was like. When I came out of the Sea Organization in 1990, Alexander was six years old, and we were watching a CNN show where these Mexican orphans were, were in a landfill looking for rubbish to sell for two cents to eat. And Alexander was horrified. He was only six years old, but he forced me to drive him to Tijuana, south of San Diego, two and a half hours there and back, to give the Mexican children his old toys and money and, and clothes. And we had a glorious day. We, we went to two Tijuana orphanages and we gave from our hearts money and toys. And Alexander hugged these orphans. And I thought to myself, he's only six years old and he cares for third world country orphans. And I realized Alexander had a big heart. His father, old and frail at the time of Alexander's death, was living at Scientology's Gold Base in Hemet, California. During the initial part of the investigation, Edward Winter at the LA coroner's office said they attempted to have the Riverside Sheriff's Office make contact with Hebert to notify him of Alexander's passing. The sheriffs went out to Gold Base and were not granted entry. They were told that they would notify Mr. Gench of his son's death. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the life of Heber Gench, a man whose journey from devout Mormon to a central figure in Scientology reveals the complex and often dark intersections of faith, power, and control. From his early years shaped by the teachings of the LDS Church, to his ascent in the world of journalism and acting, and ultimately to his controversial tenure as the president of the Church of Scientology International, Heber's story is one of ambition and adaptability. Yet, it is also a tale marked by personal tragedy and power struggles and a dramatic fall from grace. We've explored the significant chapters of his life from the pivotal role in Scientology's public relations efforts to the harsh realities of his confinement in the hole. We delved into the heartbreaking story of his son Alexander, whose life and untimely death cast a haunting shadow over Heber's legacy. Heber Gensch's life is a testament to the powerful and often perilous journey within Scientology's ranks. It serves as a stark reminder of the human cost associated with the pursuit of power and control within secretive organizations. As we close on this episode, we reflect on the intricate web of Heber's life, a story that continues to resonate within the annals of Scientology's history. The complexities and controversies surrounding his story 
are emblematic of the broader issues that we continue to explore in this series. Next time on The Sins of Scientology, we delve into the tragic and deeply unsettling case of Lisa McPherson, a dedicated Scientologist whose untimely death raised alarming questions about the Church's practices and internal policies. Join us as we explore and uncover the haunting story of Lisa McPherson, from her journey within Scientology to the mysterious circumstances leading toward her death and the ensuing legal battles that exposed the controversial methods of this organization, a story that still today continues to echo in the halls of Scientology and beyond. Don't miss this gripping and heartbreaking story. Until next time, keep questioning, keep seeking, and may your journey be as rich and enlightening as the stories you encounter.